Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Robert Kobza and I am the Vice President of the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, or uh, as we like to call ourselves, Goose. Um, this evening we are happy to be joined by Ed McGrady, who has been gracious enough to um, share both his time and his knowledge of us um, as part of our webinar series. Uh, so Dr. McGrady writes, speaks, and teaches on the design of professional games. He also runs a business devoted to using games and game techniques to bring innovative experiences in new areas. In the past, Dr. McGrady built and directed a team of 10 to 20 analysts at CNA devoted to the design and execution of professional games. Dr. McGrady has written, taught, and presented on the topic of games and their use in organizational and individual learning. In the past, Dr. McGrady has also built a team at CNA devoted to chemical and biological response operations, including domestic response operations. So that is a natural transition into, as most of you can see the title here, what uh, Dr. McGrady will be talking about this evening, which is gaming disease response. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let everybody know if you haven't been to one of our webinars before, our procedure for doing questions, um, just to kind of streamline things, is instead of you jumping in and unmuting uh, your, your mic on Zoom, uh, just put your question in the chat, and then we're going to take a few pauses throughout the presentation, and I will read those uh, over Zoom, uh, and then Dr. McGrady will, um, will answer those. Um, so with that, uh, Ed, I pass it over to you. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and uh, I'm glad you all showed up. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is just a little bit about gaming disease response and in particular, how you can use games to support public health professionals. This may seem very focused on disease, but at the same time, many of the things I talk about also apply to games in general uh, and are worth thinking about as you're designing almost any sort of uh, sort of professional game. So. Off we go, as usual. Okay, uh, who am I? Uh, I appreciate the introduction. I, I, I do a bunch of games. Uh, I also teach and there's something called the Moore's War Game Design Courses, uh, which are in cooperation with Virginia Tech. And so we have a certificate in war game design, which will come up in October. We're gonna have a cyber war gaming certificate, which is next week. Yes, there's a lot of classes in September and October. Uh, and then we did disease response games last week, ironically. We did a short course on disease response games uh, for Moors. Uh, and I've also, as, as, as was said, built a team at CNA that is still doing war games despite me leaving, which is not at all surprising. Um, and I'm currently writing a book on disease response gaming. It'll be done as soon as everything else gets out of the way. Uh, so uh, that's a little bit about who I am. What are we talking about? Uh, and typically at this point, I'd insert some sort of a, a funny picture here, but I decided not to. Uh, when I say disease response, the perception is obviously shaped and informed by the ongoing pandemic. Um, but that's not everything that we mean when we, what, that I mean when I say disease response. I've been doing this for Lord knows 20 years now, and you can do games on a whole host of different kinds of subjects that have to do with disease response. You also have an amazingly diverse set of organizations that exist within the disease response community that you can also focus games on. So when I say gaming disease response, I, I don't just mean pandemic gaming. Uh, first of all, any, like any sort of uh, uh, emergency response, the people that are doing it at the CDC and HHS are doing it all the time. They're not just doing it during pandemics. Uh, there was the Zika epidemic, and before that, there was the Ebola outbreak that occurred. Um, before that, there was the West Nile virus, if you might remember that, uh, which is still endemic in parts of the country. I suspect there are people within the CDC command center who are still tracking West Nile virus. Uh, and so these responses go on all the time. They're just sort of part of the overall Homeland Security disease response process. Uh, but you want to get them right. Uh, and just because they're not a pandemic doesn't mean you don't want to, uh, don't want to do them. So they're a, they're a topic for potential gaming. Uh, in addition, you have chronic diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, other things like that, uh, that are also in many ways amenable to gaming, though those are very different kinds of games. Uh, we also tend to think of pandemic games where you have these giant models and you're running your models uh, to look at the epidemic spread across the landscape. Uh, but you can also have very tactical games within context of disease response. We won't talk about that much today, but you can have games that involve vaccination clinics. You would be probably surprised, or maybe not, at how many different decisions and many different 
uh, issues go into running a vaccination clinic, uh, not to mention the least of which is where you park all the cars as people show up uh, in, a, in, a, in a serious situation trying to get vaccinated. Um, in addition to that, you also have the whole bioterrorism angle on this too. Uh, and so bioterrorism comes under this general rubric of disease response. Uh, and that's in and of itself almost a separate, a separate kind of disease response gaming. One which is quite common because we don't have as much experience with bioterrorism. And so games are really the best way for a lot of uh, places and organizations to get an idea of what disease response is. Um, also, I find it very useful sometimes to sort of baseline what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about games. Uh, I am talking about serious games. I'm talking about serious games, meaning that they're games played for people who actually work in the field. Uh, they're actual practitioners that are coming to your game. So when you think about games, you think about board games like Pandemic or video games. But in reality, a lot of times, it's just a bunch of people standing around a table pretending to respond to an event and playing the roles that they would actually play in real life. This is a very important consideration for the game designer because people playing the roles that they would play in the real world bring a lot of attributes from their real world jobs to the game. And those attributes include knowledge, they include the perception of how things should run, they include their own perception of how good or bad they are at the particular response. And so all those things are brought into your game that may not necessarily be coming to a hobby game or to a game for academics where you put on, put on a game for a classroom or you put on a game as part of a course uh, or as a demonstration. Uh, these are people who've actually done this stuff. So it puts a lot more pressure on the designer and it puts a lot more responsibility on the designer to work to make sure that they get things right. Um, so why do, we, why do we game disease response? Well, you would think, well, so we can do, do outbreaks better. Yeah, but also we want to coordinate things better. The number one reason you want to game in this space is because no one coordinates with anyone else very well. Uh, CDC, for some reason, we thought it learned the lesson from, uh, from uh, the anthrax outbreaks uh, back in 2001, but apparently not. So the CDC has a lot of a very hard time coordinating with HHS, likewise HHS with CDC. All of these organizations are very independent and have their own sort of lanes and charters. But when a disease response occurs, they all kind of have to come together and try to work together. This is not the easiest thing to do uh, in, in this space. And so a lot of times what you want to do is do a game to allow them uh, to practice coordination and identify where some of the sticking points uh, on coordination will occur. In addition, if you have an, uh, an, uh, a disaster under the national response framework and the incident management plans, um, medical is ESF-8, uh, emergency support function 8, or, or, or disaster medicine. And so medical has a role in, in a regular, regular disaster, like a hurricane uh, or a flooding uh, or a landslide or something like that. And especially for things like hurricanes, you'll have teams deploying, you'll have a court, part of the coordination center, the emergency uh, operations center for, for DHS will have an ESF-8 representative, an ESF-8 function, and HHS has to coordinate with them and work with them along with CDC to make sure that they get everything right. So there's a lot of coordination in this problem, and games are a very good way to get at some of these coordination issues. Um, the other one is practice. Uh, for example, in vaccine or what's called prophylaxis distribution, where you're distributing something that's going to prevent people from coming down with symptoms, which is rather common in bioterrorism events. You've got you know, 80,000 people exposed to anthrax, and you need to get ciprofloxacin into their hands, a two-week supply in their hands immediately. So now how am I going to exactly distribute all this stuff to this population? Uh, it's hard to do in the real world, though you can set up lines and you can practice it in the real world to see exactly how it's going to work and so forth. But to, to, uh, to test a lot of different concepts and to look at a lot of different variety of things, you can practice stuff in games. Um, and also, a lot of times when you're talking about uh, medical embedded in another operation, uh, like an NNS, NSSE or National Special Security event, the inauguration, um, the, uh, the Olympics, uh, the uh, conventions, assuming they're in 
in, in person, those kind of events, how is our response and treatment plan going to work in case there's a mass casualty, in case something happens within the context of this, uh, this particular event? Uh, and also planning. Uh, how exactly would we deal with a global pandemic? I've done games where we've literally used the, used the actual communications. It's more like a command post exercise in a game, but you're using the actual communications tools that are involved in the disease response to work with other countries to try to identify a lot of these issues like border closures, vaccine and prophylaxis distribution, uh, vaccine production, uh, and other issues like that that will vary between countries. And one would think that one would be prepared for those kind of things. And in fact, in games uh, and game-like exercises, we've done a lot of that stuff. We had done a lot of that stuff. Um, and what if the disease were just a little different? Uh, for example, take COVID-19, if you inverted the demographics so that old people did not get sick at all, but younger, younger children had a very high, like an 80% mortality rate, you would have a very different flavor for the response and a very different problem. And so maybe you wanna look at that and try to understand how your plan would potentially work in a situation like that, where you would plan to shut down all the nursing homes and to lock down all the nursing homes and focus on elderly people, but now you're having to do that with, with children and daycare centers instead of the elderly. Um, <clears throat> and also another big function for these kind of games in the whole homeland security space is familiarization. Uh, I've got a mayor, he's a new mayor, or she's a new mayor, <clears throat> and I need to have them understand what their role is in the plan. I also need them to understand what I'm, as the uh, medical director or the person in charge of the medical response, am going to be asking them to do, uh, whether it's public communications uh, or whether it's uh, questions about the various, come up with a response. Do you wanna close the main street? Do you wanna close everything down? Uh, where do you want to hold the distribution of prophylaxis? Uh, those kind of questions. Uh, how are you going to manage hospital capacity? Those, those can go to the, the key leader, mayor, uh, governor, uh, or even president. Uh, and you want to kind of get them familiar with that before it actually happens. These can be very emotional events. These can be very stressful events. And if you can use a game to kind of give them an idea of what's happening beforehand, they won't potentially make as bad a decisions as they would make otherwise. Um, who gains disease response? Uh, well, in HHS is the Assistant Secretary for Public Health Response, the ASPR. Uh, that's the key person for managing the command center and managing the secretary's response uh, to a potential disease outbreak. But within, uh, within that context, there's a whole bunch of other people that come together and deal with it. There's the international and national response, uh, and that's, man, can, that affects the Department of State, Department of Defense, many others play in that. And one of the roles of the ASPR is try to coordinate in a disease response, the interagency, overall interagency response. In addition for consequence management, uh, which is a little bit different than disease response, consequence management is when the trains don't run or something's contaminated uh, or you have to distribute something or, or something like that. DHS has a principal role. Um, and so um, uh, DHS runs exercises like the national level exercise, the principal's exercise, where you get the president and the cabinet and those guys together, and you're effectively playing a game. Uh, and so you're trying to get them familiar with the problem, uh, and you're also trying to understand some of their decisions so you can factor those into the HHS ASPR's kind of decisions that they're gonna make. Um, in addition, who else games disease response? DOD. Um, there's a couple of components to that, one is, I have to protect my own forces if there's a pandemic, or if there's a disease outbreak around a base or near a base, I have a relationship between my base and the community that has to work together. Uh, but in addition to that, there's the entire bioterrorism piece. Bases might be targets, DOD forces might be targets of bioterrorism, or they may simply be part of a community that has bioterrorism event. Uh, and likewise, for DOD in particular, biological warfare, though not common, is something they should prepare for. They don't tend to think about it all that much, except maybe for DITRA. And they certainly don't think about operating in a biologically contaminated environment very much, uh, as far as I know and or remember, um, simply because it's not very common. Um, but uh, biological warfare is also something that you could certainly do games on within DOD. Uh, and then also state and local governments, there's a whole push down from DHS on on training programs and using games and exercises 
I say games, they're more a tabletop discussion kind of thing that goes on. Uh, but there's grant programs that have state and local governments doing a whole variety of um, uh, disaster response preparedness drills. And obviously one of those would be with respect to disease response. Um, healthcare systems. Uh, healthcare systems, I, we put on a game for New York City one time, looking at patient management across all of their various healthcare systems during a major disease outbreak. Uh, and it becomes tricky because health, healthcare systems are not necessarily over capacity. And so as you begin to flow patients into the system, how do the various hospitals, different healthcare systems, how do they all manage that patient load uh, while at the same time managing their standard patient load uh, with respect to everything that's going on? And that's, that's very much a, a game-like environment that you can have because there's, a, again, a lot of intersecting organizations, a lot of intersecting problems that come in there. Uh, and then finally, an, another group that tends to gain disease response uh, are private institutions and foundations. Uh, for example, Johns Hopkins has done a series of games, one of which was called Dark Winter a long time ago, uh, where you go out and you get a bunch of funders together and the funders pay for a game to be produced that will highlight a particular issue uh, with, respect to, uh, with respect to the community. Um, uh, the TIP, the Transition Integrity Project, just did a game like this uh, looking at the election in November. Uh, and it made the media, it made the Washington Post. And that's the goal, is to try to sort of highlight these, uh, these, um, these issues and then also identify the challenges that might be involved. In the case of Dark Winter, it was a smallpox response uh, and they wanted to sort of highlight the problem of a large scale, out of control, highly lethal pandemic. Uh, and they brought in, uh, typically with these, you bring in the, the track two, which is people that were in government but aren't in government now. Uh, Senator Sam Nunn, who used to be on the, uh, on the um, defense committee and, and in Congress, was a very powerful senator. Uh, he played the president in Dark Winter. So you'll, you'll do things like that. Uh, to both lend gravitas to it as well as gain media attention, uh, as well as kind of see how these guys are going to react to uh, the stuff. Um, so what topics do we gain? And again, I'm just trying to give you an overview introduction here to this problem. We'll get into some more detail in a, in a little bit. Um, bioterrorism, it's always bioterrorism. In fact, if you can tell me what flag that is, uh, you get points and you get extra credit points if you tell me why I would put that flag up there for bioterrorism. Um, Pandemics, um, uh, um, healthcare and emergencies, uh, vice healthcare and emergencies. Um, so again, this being you have a disaster response, a train derailment, for example, or or a situation where you have cholera outbreak, a potential disease, waterborne disease outbreak, uh, or a tsunami where you have tsunami lung, and you have things like that going on, and you have to have uh, emergency response in that. And you find out a lot of stuff when you do games when you do games that is much more beneficial to find out in a game than in the real world. For example, when, uh, when Katrina hit, one of the big challenges was, was licensing uh, uh, healthcare workers that went to other states because as I understand it, healthcare workers at the time at least were only licensed in the state they were licensed to practice in. Unless they were federal healthcare workers, they couldn't move between states very easily and they had to have license. I think you saw that in New York where they were trying to bring in healthcare workers and the governor had to waive certain requirements for licensing. Uh, if you find that out in a game, it's a lot easier to put that in your plans and know you got to do it than it is to find it out as you're trying to get, every, get everything done. Um, other topics that you can game are chronic and non-pandemic diseases, as I talked about. Vaping is a, is, is a disease, a chronic disease that was uh, in the news and they're setting up task forces and they're trying to figure it out and they're giving it to HHS to try to work on. So why not try to look at something like that through a game um, before it actually, before it. Uh, uh, yes, I'm Shinrikyo. It's, it was the, uh, it was this subway sarin attack, but before, interesting story, before the subway attack, they tried to do an anthrax attack. Uh, and they got up on, a, they got their anthrax, I believe it was wet, not dry. Uh, and they got up on top of a building and they tried to blow it. And it turned out they had the wrong strain. So it was not the correct strain. And also wet anthrax is not gonna do a whole heck of a lot, even if it was the right strain. And so they actually executed, attempted to execute a biological attack that frustrated them so much that it didn't work that then they went ahead and did the sarin attack in the subway. Uh, there's, a, 
there's a theory that perhaps the guy who is their bio guy actually deliberately used the wrong strain so they wouldn't be, uh, 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 yeah, you obviously inverse Google search. Um, but uh, but that, that's an interesting, interesting story. And I believe it's in Seth's book that I put a reference on at the end of this briefing. Um, so, um, uh, so what do you, what do you need to know to do disease response games? Um, you need to, first of all, know how to design games. I'm not going to go into that here, but it's a thing, right? Um, it's not pandemic. And this is, this is a game where you're going to bring in people at the senior SES or GS15 kind of level that have been doing this for a very long time. And they're often very grumpy because they've been doing it for a very long time. Um, and you're going to try to put them into a game. So you need to know how to do games for, uh, in a professional environment. You also need to know how the system works. And I, the system works. And I am going to talk a little bit about that because I think this is a, this is a very important point for professional games, but more so here. Uh, I, I, I see more than anything else, a fail, there's two failure modes for newer game designers when they go into a game, game uh, situation, and especially a situation like this, where they're trying to do a game on a topic that is well known and the people are well versed in the various systems, is they don't get the system right. They don't say the right thing. They don't have the right organizational structure. They don't have the various plans and other attributes correct in the game. And that becomes a real problem because the people who show up get very grumpy when that happens. Uh, the other thing I, I think that people miss a lot of times is play value. Uh, I, I think the play, play value for a game uh, is often something that newer designers don't really quite get the handle of and, and more senior designers are like, oh yeah, I understand that. Um, and so it's, it's kind of something that's often missing. So those two things are often missing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the system and how it works here. Um, and medical knowledge is another thing with doctor stuff. You kind of need to know a little bit about it, at least be able to read and understand the literature um, because you really need to go to the literature to try to find a lot of this stuff and then go to the doctors and have them check it. Um, and a lot of times, and I'll talk about this, a lot of times the medical community doesn't do the kind of stuff that we need for games. And we're seeing that in COVID where you see all this research coming out on transmissibility and fading the environment and things like that, that aren't really a priority for most types of diseases within the medical community. Uh, and then epidemiology is more than just models. Uh, epidemiology is also how the uh, uh, index case, the first person to get the disease, transmits it to the next person and then on and on. And then eventually you get to the point where you, where you go into the, the various kinds of models. Uh, so how the system works, this is the boring part. Uh, you wouldn't be getting paid for this if it wasn't boring. So uh, I'll talk about um, uh, organization. Why am I talking about sort of this structure, organization and planning is the first thing I'm talking about for disease response. Because truthfully, the face of disease response is this. It's a bunch of people sitting in a command center. Uh, this is the secretary's EOC over at HHS, sitting in a command center uh, and uh, typing on computers. And they're all in a established an organization that has relationships with other organizations. They're all attempting to follow a plan. Uh, they certainly expect that the plan will be followed. Uh, that's the national response framework, as well as whatever pandemic plan or whatever health plan uh, uh, HHS has for it. And that's true at, at the national, state, and local levels, especially given the emphasis that DHS has put on planning, uh, that those things, uh, those things will be there. And they will expect, expect that as kind of the baseline. Um, uh, and if they don't see those, if they don't see the structure that they're expecting, if they don't see the plans they're expecting, uh, you're going to have a big problem in your game. Um, the, the, you got to get the baseline right, the organizational relationships, the authorities and permissions, the patterns and pre-established patterns and plans, and the expected actions that are pre-scripted and normal. You've got to get those into your game so that when the professionals show up, they go, oh, okay, A, you know what you're doing because you're an outsider, you're a game designer, you're not one of them. You know what you're doing, you've done your homework, uh, and also it's working the way it's supposed to. And so they're going to expect it to kind of work the way it's supposed to. Now, in a, I, I, in a game that's put on frequently for training, 
the plan is going to work the way it's supposed to because you're trying to train someone on the plan. But a game like the ones we put on is about making them think and making them think outside of the plan or adapt the plan and the organizations to the problem. Because, you know, when you're learning, if you learn by rote how to do mathematics, you can probably do the next problem. But if I give you a problem that's just slightly different than the one you learn by rote, you're going to have to apply the principles that you, under, you understand to the problem. Same thing here. We want them to understand principles and general ideas of how you respond and then apply them to something different. Uh, and games are the way that you can challenge those prescripted responses and get the players to think rather than execute on something they're trained on. Um, so, um, so we have a question in the, in, in the, uh, uh, okay, I'll wait, I'll wait on that one because it's, 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 it's not directly related. Um, exercise, so games are the ways which we challenge those sort of prescriptive things. Uh, and exercises, and this is the difference between games and exercises, exercises focus on um, getting the script right by figuring out how to manage everything when everything falls apart and go off script. The reason exercises do that is a lot of times with exercises, I've got a lot of people participating in a, in a, in a emergency response exercise. I've got, I typically have actual responders, police, fire, EMS, uh, coming to the scene. I've got people made up in moulage where they, you know, something's blown up usually because that's easier to deal with. Um, and so you've got casualties, you've got uh, fractures, you've got burns, you've got things like that with actual patients that are role playing. And you've only got about five, six, maybe five or six hours to do the entire exercise. So you don't want anybody going off, going off and doing something freelance in that situation because it wastes a lot of money. People don't get training uh, and, and things are, you're, you're spending a lot of money to do something you didn't expect. So that is an exercise can be very constraining. While as a game, you can go off script. You can, you can do things that you didn't expect and you can learn from those things and it won't waste a lot of time and money. Um, disease is an emergency response. It's just like any other emergency response. The, di the primary difference for a disease response is HHS is the lead federal agency, not uh, DHS uh, or uh, not DHS essentially, or, or DOD or state if, if it's overseas. Um, uh, unless it's terrorism or part of a larger emergency. If it is part of a larger emergency or terrorism, then DHS will be the lead federal agency and HHS will be part of ESF-8 as part of that response. It gets really tricky with bioterrorism because now you have, uh, or, or any sort of terrorism that causes, causes a consequence management response, you have the response to terrorism, which means DOJ is the lead federal agency for response to terrorism, but you also have this whole consequence management piece where DHS or HHS, if it's a disease, will be the lead agency. And so now DOJ has to work with HHS or DHS, which as you can imagine, causes all kinds of hilarity to occur. Um, the more acronyms that are involved, the better the response will be. Uh, so you have the National Response Framework, uh, which is the overarching framework with which all um, national disaster plans uh, are incorporated and in, it's in sort of the overall um, overall framework. There's the National Incident Management System, which kind of falls under the NRF. Uh, incident Management Systems, or the Incident Command System, the ICS, was a system developed by the fire service to manage their control of fires. And it turned out to be such a jolly good system that it was adopted by responders overall. And eventually it grew into the National Incident Management System and eventually into the uh, National Response Framework. Uh, and so you've got all these sort of frameworks and plans uh, and the corresponding organizational charts you have to worry about, which I've shown up here, the ICS organizational chart that you kind of have to worry about because when these guys show up, the incident command system is ingrained in the responders. And so that's something you want to be at least aware of that they will try to set up an ICS. Uh, they will try to use the NIMS or the NRF framework with the various ESF emergency support functions. To, to try to manage their, their event. Uh, the response system also has layers. There's the federal layer, which has its NRF. There's a state layer, which will have its own incident management system that the federal system plugs into because, again, within the state, 
the state governor is the lead. Uh, as we see with COVID response, the state governors are the lead and the federal system comes in to support the state when the state and, or the local runs out of resources. And then within the, within the state, the local community, especially within public health, will have its own public health service, have its own potentially monitoring service, depending on how, how big it is. Uh, New York City is almost like a state. Uh, some small rural county might have one person who's a nurse, that's their public health representative, and they're gonna need a lot more help than New York City. Um, and then you also have below the local layer, you have the private hospitals and the private providers, which represent a fairly diverse ecosystem of organizations and people and things that you can have a hospital uh, association, which is an association of different hospital providers in a, in a county. Then you have the hospitals themselves or the hospital networks. Uh, then you have your doc in a box or you have your private clinicians that may be affiliated with a hospital provider. You have that entire sort of ecosystem at the private level. And if you're doing something like a disease response, all those people become involved. And so it can be, it can be quite complicated. Uh, and they all have their own organizations, they have all their own coordinating needs, and they all have their own plans. Um, and many of these events that you have to deal with are primarily medical. Uh, you, they require little support other than just from public health. Uh, and so it's very much in the medical, medical chain. Uh, did we have a question? I'll stop here. Um, and is someone supposed to read the question to me? Yeah, so Ed, I'll just jump in here and we'll go through some of the questions um, that we've, we've gotten so far. Um, so what we've gotten, it's two parts here. So um, first, is collecting data for predictive models and games difficult? And then secondly, how effective is current disease response infrastructure at collecting feedback from responders? Okay, the first one, um, collecting data for predictive models and games difficult. Well, game, you know, I'll, I'll leave the entire predictive thing out because prediction is... Uh, hard topic and it's subject to controversy. Um, are, there, are there predictive games? Are there predictive models? Um, some, the, the standard thing is some models are, no model is, is good, but, but some are useful. Um, and so let's, let's sort of put that aside because that has to do with how accurate things are within the game or the model. Um, but collecting data to build your game as realistic as possible, which is kind of what I think you're asking, uh, or build your model within the game. Games use models though. Um, uh, even if they're just, I'm gonna roll the dice and if it's a 10, then you win. If it's a one, you lose. Um, but, uh, but collecting the information to make your game as realistic as possible is a huge challenge. It's something I'm gonna talk about later. Uh, it's a major pain uh, because, as I alluded to earlier, the medical community doesn't think like a game designer. The medical community thinks like a doctor. And so they want to identify, you know, sort of the progression of the disease in the patient, the types of treatments, um, the way the symptoms might present, maybe. Um, but they're not interested in things that we really care about, which is how exactly does it transmit from person to person? What's the probability that if you get coughed on, you're gonna get the disease? You see this with COVID, right? Uh, also the fate of the disease in the environment. If I, if I enter a room and I touch everything in the room and I have this horrible disease, what's the likelihood of someone getting the disease? Um, and you know, it goes from that to all the way, if, I, if I'm a terrorist and I take a cow that has a disease and I freeze dry it and I grind it up and I blow it up your nose, are you gonna get the disease, okay? And that's something that the Defense Threat Reduction Agency or DITRA cares a lot about, but it's not necessarily something that's really common in the, uh, in the medical literature. So it can be quite frustrating, quite interesting, but it also uh, represents an opportunity uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and so how effective, again, with the, with the effective word, is current disease response infrastructure at collecting feedback from responders? Um, most of the people that you're dealing with in the disease response response infrastructure are people who are medical professionals, meaning they have MDs. Some may have MDs and PHs in which if you get those guys in your game, be scared, be very scared. Because as I, I like to say, I think they're the smartest guys in the room quite frequently. Um, and, and they're sort of the A-team of disease response. Um, and so 
these people are used to get collecting data. They're used to making data-based decisions. And so, so in that sense, they're very responsive to, to data-based uh, decisions and collection of data and that sort of stuff. Um, at the same time, there is the entire <laughs> emergency response, the beans and bullets guys, uh, as opposed to the, to the doctors that have to also operate in this context. And that really requires treating these events like a real world contingency. And they do have analysts. In fact, CNA, where I used to work, uh, I would source analysts from my team to go out to real world events. We, were, we did the reconstruction for the Ricin event that occurred on Capitol Hill. We were involved uh, in doing analysis 9-11. Uh, we, um, we were involved in, and have been involved in quite a few quite a few medical emergency responses for HHS, particularly uh, for things like Zika and uh, things like hurricane events. Uh, and so, yeah, so we go over, we have analysts, we treat it like a mil real world military operation. We go, we observe it, we write a report, we give it to them uh, with sort of the lessons learned from it. So, so there are, and I say we, I mean we in the past tense, um, there are, mechanisms for doing that. Yes. Uh, how much they learn. Uh, I think they learn a lot. I think a lot of times the political side of the process uh, is very difficult. And so it's difficult to, to convince it. There, there's a, in, in a pandemic, especially, there's a diff, diff, difficulty getting to the tipping point ahead of the disease. So if you want to respond ahead of the disease, you've got to be very aggressive very early. And the problem is you have no evidence that you need to be that aggressive that's compelling that early. But if you wait till you have compelling evidence, it's too late. And so, so that's a political decision as much as a medical decision. It's, it's very hard to deal with. And we see that all the time in games. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. If not, if not, get back to me. Um, so plans, again, I've gone through this a little bit from the I, NRF is derived from the uh, ICS, um, and it's gone through several iterations. The National Response Plan was what I grew up with when I was doing all this stuff. Uh, and then they changed the name to NRF because why not? Um, and so I, we've already talked about, about all this. Uh, but everybody has their own set of plans. Strangely enough, that for a lot of these disease responses, they don't have really good plans. I mean, the pandemic response plan is probably the best plan that's out there, uh, as far as I know. Um, because it's hard to plan for every single contingency you're going to get to. And so um, a lot of the plans are fairly generic and very general uh, because you don't know quite what you're going to be standing into. Uh, the pandemic response plan, particularly pandemic influenza response plan, is, is not that um, generalized. It's, it's fairly specific. Uh, and big cities especially and states will have their own set of plans. I know the state of Florida has its own set of of various plans that they're, they're going to execute depending on the situation. Florida is obviously very focused on hurricanes and migration disasters. Um, there's also a system, and I just wanted to illustrate it for you. Uh, I've been talking about it. Uh, you start at the White House with the Principals Committee and the Deputies Committee. Those are the ones that are actually going to be making the decisions. They do games. Um, they're a very special kind of game, and you don't walk into the White House and do a game uh, just off the cuff. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they do games. They're called national level exercises. Uh, there's also the policy coordinating committee, which is supposed to coordinate policy across the interagency. That pushes its recommendations up to the deputies and then on up to the, up to the principals. Uh, and then you have the various agencies. You have HHS, obviously, with its subcomponents. One of the problems for HHS is those subcomponents often have a direct line to the White House. So the CDC director, at least when I was working this, could literally pick up the phone and talk straight to the president, which greatly irritated her boss at HHS. Um, it was a female at the time. Um, and, then, and then State Department uh, has uh, a bunch of different sub offices. These are, pe these are offices like five people in them as far as I remember. Uh, and the uh, Office of Global Health and Office of International Health and Biodefense, I think it's the Office of International Health and Biodefense that uh, is the one that does international. Uh, and the, I think the Bureau of Medical Services and the Office of Global Health are more worried about internal, internal health issues within the Department of State's workforce uh, 
than the actual coordination across across agencies. But HHS also has an international health health group, and so everybody has an international health group that's talking to other countries and that need to talk together uh, and, or at least coordinate together. Uh, and so you need to incorporate that into your games. Um, uh, DOD has a lot of capabilities. It's a thing into itself. There's an entire organizational structure for joint medicine. Uh, and if you play with DOD, you're going to play with the joint medical structure. Uh, and the, the one, the one thing I've learned about DOD from doing a lot of games for DOD on this subject is that even if there's a medical event and it's like bioterrorism, the doctor's not going to necessarily be sitting at the table. It's going to be the operators and the planners for DOD. And you got to kind of shove the doctor into that process. So at least you get some medical insight into what the heck is going on with DOD. So it's, that's, that's a very interesting dynamic with DOD. Um, and then Homeland Security has its own Office of Health Affairs. They sit in the command center and they liaison with HHS on the ESF-8, ESF-8 kind of issues. And then moving on, you have have the DOJ uh, as well. So you have a, a lot of potential games that you can do uh, here and a lot of potential things that need coordinating in a health response. This is true, by the way, for, a, for a, any sort of interagency governmental response. You'll see the same kind of thing going on. And then you have the National Health Response System, uh, which is the Health and Human Services Director to the ASPR, and then underneath the ASPR, all these other things uh, come in. And then you have the Office of Global Affairs, which I talked about. And the other thing not to forget is the Office of General Counsel, because you just can't go sticking needles in people without necessarily having the right legal, legal clearances for doing things like that. Um, we all know all these things like CDC, FDA, NIH, uh, but there's a couple of cats and dogs that really, I think, don't get enough attention and uh, should be included in games a lot more frequently than they often are, one of which is SAMHSA, which is the Mental Health Services Administration. In a lot of these situations, mental health matters, uh, and especially for the public communication side of things. And also the fallout, depending on how adverse the particular event is. And I would say COVID-19 is an only mildly averse event. Uh, we have 100 some thousand. Uh, if you have a situation where you have millions potential fatalities, then you need potentially a little bit more mental health attention. Um, and so SAMHSA is something that's not necessarily included all the time, uh, and it's something to think about. Uh, and then you also have to remember that, that one of DHS's jobs is to support the tribal uh, peoples within the United States through Indian Health Services. So IHS is a big thing that HHS does, and it's very different than the rest of HHS in the sense that it's a medical provider. Uh, and so uh, you, you know, Indian Health Services also has a role in a lot of these responses, especially if they cross onto tribal land and they have to coordinate with the tribes. Um, the other thing uh, that comes in, it's been in the news quite a bit lately, is the Administration for Children and Families. Uh, they're responsible for a lot of immigration, uh, detention centers, detention of children, the children that, uh, un unescorted children are maintained by ACF. Um, and so there, once, if you pull a migrant piece into your, into your game, ACF may be a, a significant, uh, significant player. Um, so, so again, you've got a lot of organizations, you got to kind of do your homework and figure out what you want to include in the game, but it's a much more complex environment than just running a pandemic model. Um, uh, things that there's a bunch of stuff that matters outside of HHS. Uh, there's a series of networks across across the states for the laboratory response network. And I just found out, uh, I think I knew it, but I'd forgotten it, that there is also an agriculture response network for agricultural diseases, which is a thing and we won't go into, but nonetheless, there's a agricultural response network as well, uh, in addition to the laboratory response network. And th what that was is that early on in the, in the, in the er like early 2000s or even before 2000, there was this problem with bioterrorism is should we get the samples and where would the samples go for laboratory analysis? Well, the only place they could really go is sort of a tier one laboratory like, like CDC or US AMRID, which is the Army's Infectious Disease Research Institute. Uh, now Homeland has its own tier one laboratory uh, as well for identifying stuff. But the sort of 
it would immediately go to the gold standard. Well, that doesn't allow for a lot of screening and a lot of capacity in the laboratory system. So they added this laboratory response network, which um, is a bunch of laboratories at the state level that can handle initial diagnostics on a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, agents and systems uh, for uh, at the state level. And so then they would, if, if they get a hit, they would then refer it up to the CDC uh, for a confirmation at the gold standard level. Uh, for example, the state of Florida, I believe, has three LRNs, one in Jacksonville, one in Tampa, one in Miami. Uh, and so those are sort of the, the, the initial first responders for the laboratories. And you gotta remember, the laboratories is kind of this own ecosystem that the samples start flowing in and they can over, get over capacity, they can not have the right, right probes and the right sample handling capability, they may not have the right BSL, uh, biosecurity, biosafety level uh, facilities to handle whatever's coming in. There's a whole bunch of issues with respect to the laboratories that you can begin to get in and on. Um, uh, so, so it's it's interesting. And and then once you start getting into overseas or terrorism, particularly if it's a nation state that's doing something, that begins to trigger the need for, as terrorism or nation state begin to trigger the need for chain of custody, for maintaining uh, consistency in your samples, uh, and also for having a reference laboratory like the CDC or AMRID or both uh, verify that it is what it is and potentially detect where it came from. So uh, um, you get attribution and then of course you get retaliation. And if you're gonna retaliate, you might wanna know where it came from at a, at a fairly high degree of uh, uh, certainty. Um, so in addition to that, you also have some other actors that are involved. Uh, if you've watched the news, you see all these people talking about how severe the outbreak is or how many people are going to potentially be infected, potentially, particularly early on in an outbreak uh, or in a terrorism kind of situation, you'll get these talking heads that come in. Uh, and two of the more frequent ones you see are Johns Hopkins, Tom Inglesby up there, uh, and also in Minnesota, Mike Osterholm, uh, kind of represent uh, sort of the, 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 in my opinion, the, some of the more knowledgeable people that, uh, that talk. And you're going to include that in your game. Uh, you can have people that are sort of talking it up. It's going to be bad. Uh, you can also have people that are talking it down. Uh, and people will have different opinions based on where they sort of sit on this, this spectrum of, of uh, thinking about the disease and the various parameters for the disease particularly early on in the disease outbreak. We're getting a little bit over that now with COVID, but early on you can get a lot of different projections. You were seeing early on in COVID that, oh, millions may, may die and, and so forth like that. You'll get that kind of stuff coming out. You need to incorporate that or at least think about that as you're doing, uh, doing your game. Well, bringing all this stuff together in a game, it's just as boring as it sounds, uh, but you gotta think about it. Uh, when you're thinking about a game in this space or any other space, it's not unique to HHS um, and the medical community. Uh, the chain of command matters, internal politics matters, rivalries matter, uh, and you know that's always my initial going in uh, uh, research quest for designing a game. I want to know which parts of the organization don't get along because my scenario is going to bring that out and it's going to make for some very interesting gameplay. Um, and so uh, politics and the structure of plans and organizations really matter. And you need to really under, understand those and make sure you represent them correctly in your game. Um, and then also you can pick your players uh, and who, what role they're put in to simulate that kind of environment and make sure you get that kind of thing going on uh, in your game. Uh, and the other thing you have to think of as I added this is have someone something for those who show up uh, anyway with nothing to do. Um, I, I pick on the Army Corps of Engineers because they're always showing up in my games and a lot of the stuff I do is kinetic, is, is, is fighting wars. And, and poor Army Corps of Engineers just often doesn't have anything to do. So I always try to find something for the representatives from the Army Corps of Engineers to do uh, within the game. So that's the organizational side of thing. And now the, the question was, where do you get your information from and why, why does it matter? And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so gaming disease. Um, uh, uh, in gaming disease, uh, when you're thinking about your scenario uh, for gaming disease, uh, 
the biology and the epidemiology of the disease are determined by the game, not the disease. Um, but with all things, you must understand the baseline in order to deviate from it. But really the requirements of the game are gonna be the best way to determine what you want your disease to do. Uh, is it a game where you're just trying to understand how the initial decisions are gonna be made? Or is it a game where you wanna actually see how they're gonna exist in a post-catastrophic post world and the, the infrastructure is beginning to fail like electrical and water and food because so many people have the disease? I mean, those are two very great extremes, but you're gonna pick your disease and the epidemi epidemiology of the disease based on the requirements of the game. But wait, you say, science. And I say, have you actually read the literature? Um, and most of these diseases have ranges of parameters. A lot of them have very different presentations. Uh, they also have different uh, fates within the individual patients. Uh, I have one disease that I, I'm particularly drawn to right now. It's called meliodosis. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, it's a disease endemic to Southwest Asia. Um, and it can present as an immediate, immediate disease, in which case it has a reasonably high fatality rate depending on the location you're in. Uh, ranges from like 5% in Australia to like 20% in, in, in Vietnam and Thailand. Um, uh, so it can have an immediate presentation, but also has a chronic form of the disease. And so the chronic form of the disease may not appear to 20 years later. Uh, and so now you have this big spectrum of potential symptomatics that could present uh, with respect to the disease. And so that allows you a lot of freedom with respect to your disease uh, and to manage it for the game. So you pick the disease. What's the focus of the game? Is it bioterrorism response? Is it medical system capacity? Uh, medical system capacity, I mean, I want something like uh, botulism, and I keep referring to terrorism because it's so much easier to control the disease with terrorism. I may want something like botulism toxin that requires ventilator capacity, uh, that is gonna tax ventilators, gonna tax rooms, and it's not gonna potentially kill a lot of people as long as they get treatment. Um, on the other hand, if it's really bioterrorism response, I, I, I want something that's just gonna stimulate the system. Um, International, national coordination, that may be more of a pandemic kind of transmissible, transmissibility may need to be high. Uh, how to practice a vaccination line, well, it better be susceptible to vaccines uh, and so forth. Um, some of these may require a little work, um, but others uh, have, uh, have given you enough. Um, and so um, you, can, uh, you can look at things uh, in terms of variables, for, in terms of uh, various various different kinds of, uh, of variables. You want to practice a vaccination line, what happens on the vaccination line, you know all these things. And so now you can control these variables through the selection of the disease. So for example, you can have disruptions. You want disruptions on your vaccination line. Well, yeah, everybody wants disruptions. People coming in and start to scream and yell. Well, in that case, you probably want something that's fairly that's fairly, uh, fairly egregious to get people to react. Uh, on the other hand, if you want something that will potentially trigger allergies, you want the vaccine to potentially trigger allergies, meaning maybe you want an egg-based egg vaccine or a vaccine that has a high allergic, allergic antigen capability. Uh, but wait, you say, I've been told what disease to use. Okay, so here you get to pick your disease. No, you don't get to pick your disease. I'm in charge. I'm gonna tell you what disease you wanna pick. Uh, and so, Let's talk about that. Uh, what do you need to know about the disease? You need to know uh, the medical presentation. Um, you need to know the progression, including fatality rate. Uh, you need to know the treatment phases, the various phases. It often goes through different kinds of phases for a disease. You need to know the pathways, the immune toxic response, a whole bunch of stuff that you need to know from the medical. You can also look at the epidemiological side. You need to know the transmissibility. How is it transmitted? What's the frequency? What's the infectious period? Fate in the environment. Fomite transfer, transfer through particles, aerosol transfer, longevity, blah, 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 blah. Uh, all of these are variables. If you look in the literature, there is very rarely something that will give you a solid take on what these numbers are. It's usually like, I'm making this up for free anthrax, it would be, uh, it would present after two to six days. Well, that's a very different, uh, uh, that's a pretty broad range. Anthrax can present as inhalational, gastrointestinal, or cutaneous, depending on how you 
how you get the disease. And so now you have a whole bunch of tools, even within anthrax, to use to sort of tailor your scenario in the game to the issues that you're trying to get at. So what I'm saying here is if you look in the literature, there's a lot of variability. Why is there a lot of variability, you might ask. Well, the reason I think there's a lot of this variability is we don't have a lot of data on certain things. We just don't have a lot of data. Uh, and as we see with COVID-19, even when we do have a lot of data, the data can vary a lot between, um, between different situations and circumstances. Meliodosis has a very different fatality rate and very different attack rate in Thailand or, 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 uh, or Vietnam than it does in Australia. Uh, and so you get this variability depending on location, depending on the strain of the disease, depending on environmental conditions, uh, and so forth. And for anthrax, we just don't have a lot of data. There's not a lot of inhalational data, particularly for anthrax. You can't have someone inhale anthrax and see what happens. Uh, and so typically, it's called wool sorters disease. Typically, we have some cases from back in the day when they would literally process wool and the anthrax would come off of the wool and then you would inhale the spores uh, from that. But that's only like dozens of data points. And so you don't oftentimes have a lot of information on these diseases uh, that can really, can really help you out. And in other cases, as we see with COVID, a lot of the research hasn't been done in terms of transmissibility mechanisms and that sort of stuff uh, until, er until everything gets going and then everybody wants to try to figure this stuff out. Uh, so that gives you a lot of flexibility in your models. Um, and we can also talk about epidemiological models. I'm not going to talk about these uh, 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 very much, but there's a compartmentalized models, uh, which is called the SIR model, or susceptible infectious recovering. Uh, and that puts people in bins and moves people between bins. The most important thing to consider on that model is it assumes sort of everybody is exposed to everybody else as opposed to, to uh, non-uniform sort of exposure. Uh, type thing, but you can make these models as complicated as you want them to be. The problem is that you really need to know what some of the parameters are you're putting into the models. And a lot of times what, they're, what the epidemiologists use the models for is to back out those parameters as opposed to put in the parameters and see what the prediction is. Um, typically you use these kind of models for epidemiology when you're looking at a game that's looking at long-term policy considerations as opposed to organizational or initial disease response kind of things. Um, I don't know whether I have it here. No, I don't. Typically what I, I do is I, I focus on the very initial phases of the disease when people are first discovering it, because that's when everybody's getting notified. That's when all the command centers are getting stood up. That's when all the plans are getting, getting dusted off and executed. So that initial phase of the disease is what we often often gain. And you don't need these kind of models for that. In fact, what you need is a detailed trace out. So when the epi guys come, you can say, okay, this person exposed these people and they're over here and you need to you know, make sure that one of them went to jail. So now you have all these prisoners. Now you need to trace out all the people that were released from the jail and then you figure out what to do with the jail because the jail's hot. And so that's the kind of thing you're giving them uh, in terms of a micro trace out of the disease. Once it gets beyond two or three generations of the disease, you're gonna get, depending on the infect transmissibility and infectivity, if it's pretty high or not, you're gonna get so many cases that you're not gonna to to deal with that anymore, and then you transition to a model, a model like this. Um, and that's what I'm talking about, the early, well, I'm talking about early phase response games, but there's also, if you look at the WHO's pandemic phases, and they have a lot of phases, they have a plan, they have a lot of phases, uh, they don't really have a phase for what we're in right now, as far as I can tell. We're kind of in the post-pandemic phase now. Um, but they're very concerned on the initial phases of uh, initial detection, initial breakout of the disease into the human population, transmissibility between humans, and then the initial country that gets affected. Those are all phases in the WHO plan. And you could potentially w look through or work through those phases in the context of a game. Uh, and then you can also think of chronic disease response games. I'm not going to get into this, but it's the research uh, and, uh, and working with things like uh, heart disease, uh, vaping, things like that. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, medical diagnosis and collaboration, uh, the systems for reporting disease. One of the things that happen is there's a whole, it's a whole thing. There's a whole system for reporting disease uh, and identifying larger trends 
that you could work through in, in both pandemic games as well as, as terrorism type games. But throughout this, one of the things I emphasize in my class is less is more. You can really go overboard in a lot of these with a lot of these diseases. And, uh, and in going, uh, going overboard, you really, I think, miss the most stressful things on the system. And, and this is an illustration of what I'm talking about. In one of my games, I simply had someone fall over dead from smallpox in the Syracuse University uh, Student Center. This is the Syracuse University Student Center. Um, what do you do now? You know, eventually the person's going to go through the system. You're going to, and that's going to, that's going to trigger all kinds of stuff. But who is this guy? Why is he in the Syracuse University Student Center? How many students were exposed? What do we do with the students? What do we do with the town? What do we do with all this stuff um, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the disease response? That simple ping of one person with the disease is enough to kickstart an entire process. You don't need a thousand people showing up with smallpox because in many ways, if you have a thousand or 10,000 people showing up with smallpox, they know what to do. They don't have an ambiguous situation. The alarms have already gone off. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do. The plans will go into, into effect and they're just gonna go, we got this, okay? Or they're gonna give up. On the other hand, in a situation like this, do we have something? Do we wanna lock down the entire country because of that? What are we gonna, you know, it's more ambiguous. And so I really think in thinking through disease response games, the temptation is always to do more, but I actually think less is, less is more. We can talk a little bit about bioterrorism. Uh, this is not bioterrorism, it's just someone spraying for mosquitoes, but it sure looks like bioterrorism to me. Um, uh, bioterrorism agents, they, need to, they have, need to have certain characteristics, easy to disseminate, persistent in the environment, uh, bonus points if you can't treat them easily, and there's a set of standard agents that they worry about. Uh, all of these agents have various issues, and they're, essentially there's a reason why we have chemical and biological weapons treaties, and that's because they're not very useful in combat. Uh, plume models means bioterrorism, and I won't go into too much because I see we're already over time, um, but, uh, um, but bioterrorism means, means plume models. Uh, HPAC is a standard model, hazard prediction assessment capability is run by DITRA. It's, uh, it's, it's a GOT software if you can get a hold of it, uh, if you're working with the government, uh, it's a sort of a standard model. Plume models are all wrong, trust me, but they're, but they're useful. They're useful to visualize for the players what the potential problem is. And truthfully, they're useful for first responders to kind of try to get a visualization for what, what's going on. There's been a lot of work to try to give them actual models that actually tell them something. Your mileage may vary with that. Uh, but if you're just doing a plume model for a game that's a casual game or even a, even a professional game for that matter, just making sure you get the size right. You know, you got a five mile an hour wind, it's gonna be roughly this wide, and it's going to go roughly this far. That's, that's what you're really getting out of the plume models. Um, Bioterrorism also means law enforcement agencies don't screw with the FBI. They're really good at finding you, particularly when they get court orders. So be very careful in your games when you have terrorists running around and when the terrorists are essential to your game and you have a chase the terrorist situation because LFA, law enforcement agencies, uh, LEA, uh, are really good at their job and they will round your guys up like that, which is really embarrassing when they don't get a chance to do their bioterrorism event because they're already arrested. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff that we don't have time for, talking about strategic response games, operational games, and tactical games. Uh, the tactical games are all about uh, the, sort of the, the, the tactical, detailed operation of the problem. Operational have to do with things like allocation of stockpiles, capacity management, surveillance, treatment and production, and strategic are all about coordination, some of these, uh, some of these other kinds of issues. Um, intersecting issues worth noting. You may have noticed politics become a problem. As I said, there's this tipping point that you got to worry about. Uh, news media and information operations. Um, you know, you got to understand this problem and exactly how different kinds of insertions in the news media uh, stimulate events. Uh, and cyber can factor in, particularly when nation states or, or terrorists become involved. Uh, cyber can become a factor. That's another whole, whole issue of incorporating that into games. Um, and international, both in terms of countries, is also uh, the air agency. Um, so there's a whole 
This is a very rich area for gaming. There's a whole lot of stuff you can do. Uh, there's, it's as rich in some ways as defense gaming. Uh, and it uh, is a very useful thing. Unfortunately, they may not pay a lot of attention to our games, but I think that's a problem we have across the board in gaming is that the decision makers may not pay attention to us. Uh, and truthfully, that's because they're in, a, in a political situation, they have other considerations. We go, we really need to do this. Yeah, but I have all these other things I need to think about. You need to put those in your games too. So you get that kind of tension within the game. Though they do know it's a bioterrorism game, so they, they're probably going to do what they need to do, uh, as opposed to the real world, where they don't really know, and there's real world consequences. So thank you. I'm sorry I ran 10 minutes over time. I'll be glad to answer questions or discuss or whatever you guys want to do. I do have a couple of references that I'll put up. Uh, that, that bioterrorism and biocrimes, the illicit use of biological arms in the 20th century by Seth Karras. Good, good, good reference. It's free over at MDU at the WMD Center. I would highly recommend it. Um, okay, so I'll let someone read the questions to me if there are any. Yeah, certainly. Well, first of all, thank you, Ed. This was a, a great presentation, and, and no worries about the uh, about the time. Um, so, first question we have: um, Any commercial games for disease response um, that brought out new ideas, or, or are there any commercial games for disease response that brought out any new ideas for running your games? Um, they wouldn't be about disease response. I, I, I tend to draw on a lot of different kinds of games uh, for the ones uh, I do. Uh, but truthfully, I am a, I am a seminar, my, my, my ground state for games is a seminar game, a role-playing seminar game. And that's just kind of where I go. And so role-playing games in general, I guess would be a, a thing. Uh, but I, it's, you know, commercial, commercial games on disease response are not going to be that exciting. And the purpose of commercial games is to sell games. And so it's, um, I mean, accurate commercial games on disease response are not going to be that exciting. And so um, you're going to make, to make it exciting, you're probably not going to do what you really do. So, so no, there's not a lot of commercial games. All right, so next question. What are some of the most common problems you have seen in pandemic, pandemic or response games? Um, the most common problem is a lack of willingness on the part of agencies to share resources. Um, because that's, that's their resources and they don't want to overtax their resources. Uh, and therefore they're going to stand back and let someone else do it. Uh, and so there's a, tendency to hoard resources or uh, stand back with resources and wait to see who what what other people do um, and that tends to go with information too to some degree um, and in addition the other thing you see all the time is this is this and it's really hard to simulate in games is this political tipping point between you know the disease is, is running ahead of the is always ahead of the political decision and so uh, how you deal with that in games because the politician knows he's in a game. So it's really hard for him not to know he's in a game. Uh, and you can use all your game tricks to trick them, but they, they're politician. They still know they're in a game. So they're going to do the right thing, even when in the real world they might be tempted not to do the right thing. All right. So next, have you done interstate war games about disease response where you have a mix of both cooperation and divergent interests and priorities? Um, sure. Um, a lot of inter, did you mean interstate as an in inner, inner within the United States or international? Um, I international, like two countries, um, you know, two warring countries or, or yeah, warring countries, just different states. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, uh, okay. Two, two different states. Let's, let's, let's take, put aside the war for right now. Um, or the conflict security issue. Uh, in a normal pandemic response, you do, you do get a lot of divergent, divergent attitudes on things like border controls, um, uh, movement controls, uh, vaccine distribution and production, uh, the sharing vaccines, all of those things become issues in these international, international things. One of, one of the, but you know, the most important thing in these games oftentimes is the most bureaucratic, simply what constitutes a reportable incident of the disease. Uh, and how you report the disease and how frequently you report the disease 
and, and what numbers you're giving. So just reconciling all the different numbers and the way countries count stuff can be an issue or define the disease or even worse, what phase of the disease are in. So one country may go, we're in phase three and the other country goes, we're in phase two, but they're both in the same situation. They're just defining their different phases differently and that means something for how everything flows and goes and that sort of stuff. So those are the kind of, kind of real issues that you tend to encounter. Um, and uh, now when you introduce conflict, I, I think there's a very interesting category of games where you have a, a serious disease situation. I, 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 I've run this quite frequently um, in certain contexts. Uh, you have a, a, a disease outbreak, SARS was an example, COVID was another example, where the country is uncooperative, uh, where the initial index country is uncooperative, but it's coming to you. And if that country is extremely uncooperative, like, no, you can't come in and help me. Okay, now you have a real problem because you have a, a security situation that's layered over top of a disease response. And I don't think we've thought a lot about that context where you have an active security situation and a disease response, uh, particularly when it's a transmissible disease uh, or, if, or a disease that can be, that, that, that propagates. And so I think that that's an interesting question. And it's a very interesting question in games and watching people grapple with that in games. What do we do? Um, Generally, they don't do a lot, but uh, they, they, it's, it's, it's for, the, for the people other than just in general, just that requires the, the, the military DOD guys, the operators to get together with the medical guys and try to figure stuff out, which is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. so. so the next question is a bit long. Um, it's two parts. Uh, feel free to let me know if, if you need me to repeat any part. Um, do NGOs have any unique properties compared to government agencies that should be thought about for pandemic games? And does the inclusion of NGOs change participants' thought processes or the flow of the game in interesting ways? Um, well, NGOs, NGOs are going to show up in any sort of disaster response. If you got a, if you got a, uh, any, sort, any sort of disaster event is going to potentially draw NGOs uh, as, part, as part of the response process. Um, and so you have, you have to be aware of, you know, I'm trying, a lot of what I was doing here is trying to make you aware of things you have to be aware of in your games. That's another thing that you have to be aware of in your game. Um, and so you just kind of have to maybe have a player, maybe incorporate them, uh, have an NGO player. Uh, I think there's certain features of NGOs that you need to sort of understand as you're incorporating them into your game. Uh, they're in, in many of the NGOs, and if not most of the NGOs, are very focused on their sort of visibility and their potential for, um, for fundraising. And so that can color what they do and how they want to do it. And so you've got to kind of be aware of that. Um, and uh, so I think those are the two things that come off the top of my head. Um, and so you want to incorporate them into your game because they're going to be there. Um, they, they have a unique property in the sense that, that they can potentially get into places where the U.S. government not, might not be able to get in, uh, and that presents a potential advantage with respect to uh, gaining information about what's going on. There's a whole, and, and, and talk about NGOs, the other thing you have to realize in your game is there's a whole information architecture that's built up around disease response, ProMed. Uh, is a mailing list which you can get on that has, and, and unless you're serious about it, don't get on it because you'll get terrified, but it basically has all the various disease response outbreaks reported from people on the ground dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm sure, I haven't looked in recently, but during the early phases of COVID, about every week or so, they would come out with a summary of everything that was currently known about the COVID outbreak. This was back in February. Um, and, uh, and so they, they do the same thing for Ebola. They do the same thing for just random outbreaks of things like Zika or something like that. Um, and, uh, it's a mailing list you can get on and that will talk to doctors who are on scene and may, that may, ProMed may have better information perhaps than your intelligence people or your, or your, uh, or your government guys, simply because they have a much broader reporting reporting network that comes in uh, to that, so. Long, long answer. <laughs>
Oh, that, that was great. Um, so next, uh, for DOD designers who deal with conflict-focused games, how do, you, how do you think pandemic or disease response games differ in terms of execution and design? And the map doesn't matter that much. I mean, you're not going to be doing maps and counter, you know, hex encounters kind of stuff. There's no, <laughs> you don't, you don't charge into battle against the disease on a, on, you know, across the fields and up the hill. Um, and so uh, the only, about the only time you do maps and counters are for things like a, like a, uh, uh, a vaccination clinic or something like that. You might have that there. You would also have maps with plume models and stuff on it, but that's, that's the kind of stuff that you would, you would do. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have the, kind of adjudication that you have in a, in a uh, Hex Encounters uh, war game where you're, you're, you're saying, okay, the bomb, you know, I did today, you know, 12 B-52s come in with El Razm, how many, how many ships are going to get destroyed? A lot. Um, and uh, and that, kind of, that, that kind of adjudication is just not going on. You're giving, you're giving the input to the players and letting the players work with each other and it's really that crosstalk between the plans, the organizations, and the scenario that's actually building the game, as opposed to everybody standing around a map worried about worried about how to take the hill. So one question that just entered Ed, I find particularly interesting. Um, so how would you redesign Pandemic, the commercial game, to make it more a more representative or authentic Pandemic game? Um, you could, you could, I think you could do that. I think it wouldn't be as, as interesting. Um, first of all, first of all, you know, I, I teach this stuff. So one of the things I'm constantly trying to push back on is the idea that in a professional game, these me game mechanics from commercial games are easily transposed and players will both accept them and, uh, and be able to manage them. Um, you know, bidding for a, for a particular item or uh, the idea that you you need to to go here and here and here and put this together and get the various elements that you need to sort of to get the vaccine and, and vaccinate everybody and stuff like that. That's not how it works. And so real players are going to be totally baffled by needing to do something that isn't commensurate with how it actually works in the real world. Even if you're a clever mechanic, somehow simulates how it works in the real world, they're gonna be baffled by it. So I, I, I personally really discourage this idea of game-like, too many game-like mechanics in a game. You can use them, but you gotta use them very carefully or the players are gonna get really irritated. Uh, and I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen now because uh, I realize I'm doing that. Um, the players are, gonna get, players are gonna get really irritated if you do that. Um, and so, um, so, uh, in pandemic, the, what you could, the, what I would save from pandemic is the idea of the cubes representing the number of disease uh, at the particular location, um, and then you would have the people responsible for whatever that location was trying the best they can to get resources out of someone or something that they could apply to the actual actual treatment of disease. And you would also have to have, because it's the real world, this trade-off feedback loop between um, shutting everything down hard, if it's a pandemic kind of situation, shutting hard on movement controls, and also your economic impact. So you would want to have something that showed the trade-off between the economy and the shutdown uh, with respect to the, uh, to the game. And so I think you could do something with that uh, with respect to kind of a but the only thing that would remain would be perhaps a map and p and 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 cubes that represented the disease, uh, and then in terms of resources, it would all be off in another display where you displayed the number of, of required resources that you had, whether it was number of vaccines or that sort of stuff. Uh, Pete Pellegrino has done a wonderful training game, not a professional game, but a training game uh, or an educational game. He did it for. Get the university he did it for, but he did it for a university uh, that used a very detailed pandemic model that he created um, to uh, to let the students sort of dynamically play with the various variables, whether it was shutting down transportation or distributing vaccine 
or and who do they want to distribute the vaccine to first? Those kind of questions. And the students would make these decisions, hand them to Pete. He would, he would as, as a good war college controller would, he would type them all into the to the donculator and it would come up with the with the answer and he'd give it back to them. So he's done a game like that, which I, I think is probably the closest you could get to some sort of a major pandemic game. So hope that answered the question. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you. Um, so additionally, um, in writing your book, did you encounter an interesting war game about pandemics, uh, whether in a good or bad way? Well, they, they, they did the, the uh, war game before. I, I didn't focus in my book. I don't focus too much on pandemics. I have a, have a piece on pandemics, but I, it's not all about pandemics. I tried deliberately to, to avoid that uh, because I think there's so many other aspects of disease response uh, that matters. Um, but, uh, uh, I mean, I think there have been some really good games. I think the one they did right before the pandemic <laughs> sounded like a very good game. I was not involved in it, but it sounded like a very good game. They got to the right conclusions. Uh, I mean, it's not hard. Uh, and so, um, um, yeah, I, I think there's been a whole series of these games starting really probably one of the first was Dark Winter, uh, looking at, at major transmissible outbreaks and, you know, I think that, that the challenge wasn't doing a good game uh, or uh, uh, having the right science or anything like that. It was just simply listening to the result, you know, which is hard for politicians to do, I think. So you mentioned earlier, uh, you talked a little bit about kind of player behavior. Um, so how do you try to promote bad behavior, like not sharing resources when the game is a cooperative endeavor, so people might gravitate towards being altruistic? Well, uh, I think the way you do that in games is you, is you twist it so that you give them something that's not quite what they expected. Remember, these guys are coming expecting a standard game where they try to train and execute the plan. That's what they've done all the time. So if you give them something interesting, an unusual little twist in the game, that they didn't expect, like in my example, might be switching meliodosis for anthrax. Holy crap, what do we do now? The minute they say that, you've got them. And, and, and then they're going to suspend the disbelief in the game and they're gonna behave like they would in the real world because they're, they're now entranced by the game. And it can be something that's very simple that you give them that just triggers them to start playing like they would in the real world. Now, obviously, they're not going to be complete most of the time. They're not going to be complete jerks about stuff. They do rise in their own game, and their boss is probably watching. But if you can get them hooked in that way through a really good scenario and giving them the kind of materials they would expect from that scenario that are realistic and that confirm that they're in the real world, then you can hook them in, and they will behave like they would behave in the real world. Uh, I, I have great confidence in that. So... All right, so next question here. What are some of the specific challenges in advocating game results and how do you get over them? Um, specific challenges in advocating game results. Well, first of all, getting someone to listen to you is probably the hardest thing, getting the meeting. And also I think to some degree, what, what happens is the game designer and controller, the person who runs the game, isn't necessarily always the one to brief out, particularly when they brief out to the highest levels of government, uh, like the secretary or the, or the deputy secretary or something like that. It's always, oh no, you did the game. Often it's a contractor. You did the game. I'll take the results and I'll push them forward. And so a lot of times the nuance or the important elements of that get lost in the translation between the chain of briefing that occurs uh, as it gets briefed up the chain. So I think there's some element of that. I think there's some element of, oh, it's just a game, I'm not gonna listen to it. Um, and I think to really understand, you have to play in the game, which they do have people playing in the game, but they don't really play in games at the most senior level. They don't play in the games. It's a lot of, it's, it's often scripted. They're often pre-briefed on what they're supposed to do uh, and that sort of stuff. Cause you know, these guys don't wanna look bad and I don't blame them, frankly. Uh, and so, and they don't have a lot of time either. And so this translation from the experience of the game and the learnings from the game up to the most senior levels is a, is a hard thing. 
I think. Um, and it's true for any sort of analysis. It's not just true for gaming. It's true for any sort of really good operational analysis, getting it up the chain of command uh, to the right decision maker with the right briefing, uh, formatted in a way that decision maker can understand and take action on. It's a skill. It's a skill a lot of people don't have. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so at this point, um, we are out of questions here. If anybody else has any, any last minute questions they want to throw in, in the, the remaining time here, feel free to do so. Um, but in the event that nobody else has any questions, I just want to personally thank you um, for, again, sharing your time here this evening um, and giving us this presentation. Um, and uh, I, I found it uh, very interesting. Uh, additionally, um, for those in attendance, I want to thank you all also for, for showing up here this evening, contributing to the discussion. Um, and I'm going to be posting some of the information um, for both the Georgetown University War Gaming Society's Twitter and website, but also our YouTube, um, where you can find this recording if you ever want to go back and, and rewatch it or share it with somebody else. Um, additionally, um, our next events uh, are on September 21st. We have uh, Volker Runke, who will be talking about cards and war games. Uh, again, that's on the 21st, same time, uh, uh, 6 o'clock Eastern. Um, and then on the 29th of September, we have Bruce Mansfield and Jason Carr who will be discussing history and principles of solitaire war game design. Um, and that again is at the same time, um, six o'clock. So um, again, thank you so much, Ed, for sharing your time with us um, and everybody here this evening. Uh, and I leave it to you if you have any final words. No, I just appreciate everybody hanging out for this long on a, on a weekday night. So um, appreciate it. If, if you need anything, uh, I assume you have my contact information. So more than happy to give advice if somebody needs advice on something.